So I wanna welcome everyone here to our July 2021 community to community meeting for our Wildfire Survivor Network. And we're here um, as Rebuild North Bay Foundation to help support those uh, who have been through fires and are in the road to recovery. And we are just helpers along the way because we've been through that. And so um, as learners ourselves, we know that each community has their own challenges and their own obstacles, but there are also some similarities and ways we can help each other. So I'm so glad that I can be on this call with people from all over, um, from Oregon to Santa Cruz to, to Paradise and beyond. And so we can just help each other get through this. And so this month we're focusing on the topic of how to, as a community, um, figure out how to mark that day that marks the one year after the fire that that came. I, I have trouble saying the word anniversary because it sounds so celebratory. So what words do we use and what actions and what ways of gathering that are full of meaning, that are sensitive, but also bring a, a kernel of hope to the things that we need to keep us moving forward. And so we're going to look at uh, how three different communities did that. And um, we've invited people um, who've done that and that each one did it so differently. That's what I find so interesting because as you know, each community is unique and they'll be at a different point in their recovery and the people make it unique, make the need for that reflection, need for that way of remembering and that need for participation. Um, just special for what's appropriate there. So we've invited, I'm gonna first introduce um, uh, those who are speaking and just briefly tell us uh, your name and where you're from. Um, Kat Merrick from Ventura County, just briefly. Um, Kat Merrick, Ventura County, Totally Local BC's The Local Love Project, which was founded two days after Thomas Fire. Um, we've serviced Thomas Woolsey Hill, we sent supplies to Paradise, Reading, um, and some to Oregon, so. So thank you so much for being here today. And Melissa Schuster? Uh, yeah, Melissa Schuster, Paradise. Um, I was on the town council during the, the campfire. Um, and we, I was also in partly responsible for convening the group that talked about the very things that you will be talking about today in terms of how do we mark this day? What do we call it? Um, yeah. And yeah, and well, thank you it was so a big much. deal. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Julie O'Dwyer, will you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Julie O'Dwyer. I'm here up in uh, Southern Oregon, part of the Jackson County uh, Community Long-Term Recovery Group, and also been working a lot with Rebuild North Bay to help spread the word of how we can connect these communities. So I'm really glad to hear from all of you and hoping that this video is gonna get shared because our community is um, trying to figure out how to prepare for this memorial um, and this, this coming year as we unfortunately watch smoke roll over our hills today, so. Definitely. Thank you so much. And who is on the line from Santa Cruz? I don't know if you're able to. It, it's it's me, Valerie. Sorry, oh, I, Valerie. Switched, okay, I switched over. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Valerie, you want to introduce yourself so um, everyone on the call knows? Yeah. So my name is Valerie Brown. I am the um, <laughs> renewing chair for the um, Santa Cruz Long Term Recovery Group. Uh, so the CZ Fire. Yeah, is, maybe 12, 1500 homes that were damaged or destroyed uh, last year. Um, I'm with United Policy Holders. Uh, I'm your senior program officer for our Roadmap to Recovery program where we uh, work with people with the insurance issues. And, and for me personally, my community burned in 07. Um, I was the volunteer coordinator for about three days, ended up getting sucked into long-term recovery for three years. Um, and you know, speaking of fires, there was just one three miles from my house on Sunday. Um, you know, San Diego, we have a, you know, we have a published fire from Cal Fire or Cal OES every day. Um, and we just, you know, most of them, 90% of them are under 10 acres. So we, you know, we're, you get the smell, everybody runs outside. 
um, new volunteer. And so for, for my people, it's really fresh down here in San Diego because we have one, what they used to call a hundred year fires. We tend to have one every four or five years. And so we're, we're kind of like old hats at that. And um, I just, I really was excited about this program because um, I know how my community does them here in Southern California. I've seen how other communities have done them, but um, with the devastation we had last year, it seems like there's this opportunity to share and connect resources in a way that uh, we haven't ever been able to do before. And we have four states that had fires. And for me, because we're working with people in, in all four states and different communities, it's an opportunity to take what I learned here and be able to share that with the other long-term recovery groups that might not be part of this network yet, but are, are able to piggyback off of the exposure. So looking for what I can share with Santa Cruz, but then obviously I'm putting my UP hat on and sharing it in other communities as well. Absolutely, and we have so much respect for you know, United policyholders. In fact, as a fire survivor myself, um, the resources and information I received from United policyholders was invaluable for my own personal recovery and that of my neighborhood. And, and just like you said, this is a big situation that is only growing. And for Rebuild North Bay Foundation, for United Policyholders, for all these LTRGs and, and other organizations, there is plenty of work for all of us to keep connecting, collaborating, and help make progress. And that's really what we're all here to do is to make this road uh, the difficult, difficult road to recovery just a little bit easier by helping one another. So I'm grateful for all of these organizations that are willing to just, hey, let's let's all get this done the right way and to help people um, so they don't have to make the same mistakes that we made in Coffee Park or wherever you are in San Diego or and know what to expect. So we learn so much from each person and each each fire as it comes. And as you said, we have some going on right now um, up north and south. And it, it seems to be the daily weather report is where's the fire starting today? And how can we make sure um, that lives aren't lost and homes aren't destroyed in that process? And, and I just wanna acknowledge right now that not only is fire such a horrible and difficult thing to deal with, but those fires that took place in 2020 and also now happening in 2021 are doing in the context of the pandemic. And just the idea of having to do this work while having the pandemic's restrictions, um, I just have take my hat off to all of you working in this space and, and um, this other obstacle just makes it that much more difficult. And, and I wanna be respectful of that. If I misstep in a comment I make, or you think, hey, that's not gonna work for us because of the pandemic, please say so, because I wanna be as sensitive to that as I can in the situation. I'm grateful that things are opening up more, but we do have to be careful still with the new variants out there and not everybody having their vaccinations yet. So as we move forward on the call, um, I just wanna say that if you, if you are watching this, I mean, if you're not on here live with us, of course, we share the recording on our YouTube channel um, and it, they're the, in, a, in a playlist called Community to Community or C2C, sometimes we call that for short. And on our YouTube channel, Rebuild North Bay, we, um, we also have a new podcast that inter interviews a lot of different people on how to tackle uh, these issues, and it's called the How to Disaster Podcast. And uh, in fact, we even um, had Amy Bach on two episodes recently from United Policyholders. So um, definitely check that out. If you are seeing us online, check out YouTube for the podcast and these C2C recordings. That's where we have them all. Um, now, as we go into our theme for the day, um, I think the way that we're going to handle that is we're going to invite each of our folks to tell their story of how they um, planned for and collaborated to, to mark that one year anniversary. And, you know, go ahead and take, uh, Melissa and Kat, take 15 minutes um, to tell us what you did, how that worked, and we'll just listen. Um, and if we have questions, we'll put those at the very end after 
the three of us, because I'm going to actually present on how um, I organized the one year anniversary here in Coffee Park in Santa Rosa after the Tubbs fire in 20. The fire was in 2017, and then, of course, one year after was 2018. And what's so interesting to me when I talk to you to plan for this call is how very different each of our situations were. Um, same in uh, the things that were going on in our heart, but how it played out for your communities was each unique. So um, I didn't plan necessarily who to start with, but let's take let's take Kat first, if that's okay with you. Um, and Kat, um, we would love to hear a little bit about your fire story and then how that rolled into your work and your one year remembrance for your community. Um, I'm a fire survivor too. And Pam, I didn't realize you were when we spoke, you didn't mention that. And uh, so as I always say, we belong to a club that we don't really want to belong to, but um, it's nice to meet you and see the work you're doing. It's inspiring because you know, the night we got hit with the Thomas fire, we we have a 20 acre avocado ranch. We lost our home, three rentals that were on the property and 283 avocado trees. So we were put out of business in a multitude of ways. And my agricultural education foundation, which we do a lot of education up here was gone overnight. So multiple impacts. And uh, we spent three days uh, fighting the fire because we saw no fire trucks. There was no water. Neighbors were putting hoses together down below our ranch and um, coming up friends with shovels and we were climbing hills because one house caught fire below us and then within the next day, the winds were kicking up and two more houses were gone. Uh, so the ash and the things that were burning, our ranch was causing that to blow into, their, into that neighborhood. And the fear was we would lose more homes. So in the midst of fighting fire for three days after losing our home, uh, a group of us that had, we have a background in event, putting event coordination and uh, some friends said, and some local organizations that knew me, nonprofits said, we need to sit down and talk. And I went and met on the second night of the fire with a group and said, let's collaborate. And we immediately, as you, I'm sure Pam are, can attest to, you see the gaps much clearer when you're the vic uh, survivor. I know we hate that word, but when you're the survivor um, and you're more sensitive to it as well. So we saw those and they wanted to hear from me. And immediately what came out of that meeting was we were going to form the local love project. We were all gonna coordinate our efforts and start bringing in supplies that we saw immediately were needed. And from there, the local love project grew. Um, you know, in our first year, we distributed $1.3 million in brand new product, clothing, household items, um, and then also grant funding that was coming through through our LTRG and others. In our second year, almost $2.3 million in brand new furniture, clothing, household items. Um, and then in the pandemic, we continue our work with those that are being affected. So in that, all of that, we not only were conscious of the third year anniversary, but I mean, the first year anniversary, but we were also being conscious of holidays. Ours hit right, at, right near Christmas time. So you have to think about that. So our very first like fun event, we would say, people were still living in hotels, all of that. We got Santa and Mrs. Claus and we visited hotels. Every, every kid got to pick a toy. Uh, every room, they went back to their room and there were stockings for all of them. All the firefighters and crews that were staying in hotels went back to their rooms and did, got a surprise stocking and thank you notes. Um, we really wanted to start the process of healing and understanding that we are in this together. And we did quite a few events that were not only maybe uh, distribution events, but also that building that confidence too, which you all know is so hard. They're in shell shocked. We're walking zombies for a year and, and the fear of being taken advantage or doing something wrong or, you know, it's a tough it's a tough situation so we really wanted them to know we're here you can lean on us and we're here to support you and we're very grassroots boots on the ground which is a little different than a lot of organizations were and meanwhile so, you're displaced yourself yeah well we were juggling trying to find a place to stay with two big dogs and trying to figure all that out it was it's, it's been a long long haul i look back and i just like it's a blur but um the anniversary was coming up and again we, we didn't call it, an, you know, we didn't, we were, like you said, Pam, it's a very sensitive anniversary celebration. We didn't want that. What we kept saying, a remembrance event, to Thomas Fire remembrance event, and that it was going to be a celebration of resiliency, 
of how our community came together and how we worked together to overcome this difficult time and to continue each year to, to try to remember it and understand that we're still in recovery. They say three to seven years with a pandemic, we're looking at 11 to 13 plus years. Uh, we haven't rebuilt. We're still fighting away with the counties, trying to get our rebuilds going. Uh, so it's, it's a, you know, it's a really sensitive, as you all well know, process. Um, and if I'm taking too long, red flag me. So uh, we came together again. I called in my event groups, everyone I knew, started calling my um, my local musician friends. We've got some very well known uh, local musicians from Big Dad Booty Daddy to the rest of them who were like begging, you know, musicians you two are always the first ones. What can we do? Let's do a fundraiser. And said yes, we but we want to do it on a kind of grand scale, and we really want to do it in a in a really respectful way. So. We talked to the city of Ojai and took over the Libby Bowl. Uh, they granted it to us. We only had to pay a small fee on a few things. They were wonderful about that assistance. Uh, we took over the park area that is right in front of it. During the day, we had one section that was resource section. Um, you know, because again, all those, I, I don't know what you did in your communities, but immediately they had a resource center people could go to and one stop shop for all their stuff but a year later it's not there but then people are coming out of shell shock and they're like uh, i don't i i don't understand i need help we set up a complete resource center they could go through and it was private enough in the area of this park and we made it very quiet and very easy very approachable and they were able to go and talk to the different organizations that still had assistance or future assistance or any any kind of help at all that might be out there so Salvation Army, you know, Red Cross was there, um, 211, uh, not, you know, United Way, everybody was there from little guys to big guys. So we did that. Um, we also on the other end of the park had a big area that had smaller musicians playing. In the morning, there was a yoga class. Uh, and then we had um, like drum circles and the artists in our community, we have a huge artist community. Um, many lost a lot of their work. Um, but had started working again, you know? So they were given free booths and obviously prime locations and they were able to sell their wares. Uh, again, it's close to the holidays, so it was good, good timing. And uh, then we allowed other artists to pay, which helped you know, us cover, cover some of the expense for the event. We did not make it a moneymaker event. We even raised funding so that if we lost a little bit, we, we were okay uh, because the goal was every, into the music part of it, which started later in the day and the evening, we made a point that any survivor that registered, they and their families up to four could come in. It couldn't bring friends, but they could bring family or a significant other, um, got in for free. And if they wanted to buy tickets, they had it at an extremely reduced, we kept the ticket price really low, but it was extremely reduced rate. So everyone could come. Every one of them that came in got a t-shirt, a um, you know, one year remembrance t-shirt and uh, which was beautiful. One of the local artists did the artwork for us. He would not let us pay him for it, even though he's still suffering and trying to recover. He was amazing. Um, and so we had a lineup of music and the grand finale again was Santa Claus came out. You know, we, there was a lot of speakers. Our government officials came at different segments through the day got up and spoke to the community and they were from the areas that were mostly the, the most impacted. And, um, it, you know, it really was meaningful. And at the end of the evening, everyone's in tears and everyone's kind of giving this love and this big conversation was going on with the audience. And we knew we needed to take it back up and Big Bad Voodity runs back out and introduces, you know, Santa Claus comes out of nowhere with his elves and walk through handing out candy canes and hugging everybody um and just made it just so fun people were cheering and laughing and dancing behind him in the aisles and it, the, it really ended with just a big community hug and that's what we said we're putting on a big community hug to say we are in this together whether you were affected uh, impacted with your losing losses no matter who you are you were impacted if you live in this community you have a friend a relative someone you know uh you're impacted and so this is a time to come together and really be able to share that local love. So that's what we did. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, did you, um, 
I remember reading that this is a, ended up being kind of an annual thing now. Yes, yes. And even during the pandemic, there was something. If you could just elaborate well, on that a little bit. Yeah, we um, the second year we came together with the musicians and decided to do a little, little bit smaller, but something that could also be a fundraiser as we didn't realize how long this, we, we initially started the local up thinking we're just going to go in and help. And then the big guys will take it and we'll step back and say, hey, we just, we're trying to help. Um, you know, and look at how many years later and we're still in there, still at the table. So we were like, we need to do some fundraising too so we can continue our efforts. And so we uh, put together a holiday CD, a holiday CD. Um, local artists came together, created, uh, did, picked a Christmas song and did it. And um, it's a beautiful, I'll have to send you it. You'll, it's, I'll, I'll be happy to send all of you a copy. It's just beautiful. Uh, a friend over at uh, Tower Records in Hollywood did all the mastering on it. So this thing is very professional, very well done for free. Again, everyone donated their time and energy and we sold those and local love hats and everything else we could. And we put on a big event and all, uh, all the musicians came in and played. And um, it was actually, it seemed more impactful to me at that second year of just wow, we're still in this and people still care and they're still there for you. And I think people were just, that's what we, our come away was, was you haven't forgotten us. And uh, this year in pandemic, we did a video, fun video thing where you could zoom in and it was fun, but you know, it, it wasn't the same because it's not that emotional being together and you know how important a hug is, uh, we all do. Uh, and then this year we're looking at what we may do. We have a group a friend of mine that does concerts in your cars it's massive down at our fairgrounds he was able to pull that off for covid so people could go and hear concerts and uh we're talking about possibly bringing some of these musicians together again and doing a two-day uh local love um come out share the love and and celebrate our resiliency of our community so it's really interesting to see how very meaningful and impactful music and art are and these times of tragedy and they can really bring people together and and just sharing a song together, whether you're just strumming a guitar around a camp, I don't wanna say campfire, but around, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't like to put up campfires, but I would say, you know, you're sitting in a parking lot with a guitar or you're on a big stage, like you said, yeah. bringing people together around song can be quite amazing. Yeah, and, and you know, even like the small things in the park uh, with the drum circle, I walked by twice at different times when they were playing during the day as I was checking in on everyone and people were just sitting there drumming and crying and it was a release, you know, it was, I'll start crying. It was, you could just tell they needed something, you know, and music really does that. We know that. Yeah. And um, to me, that's what we were trying to give people is a release and to also know that, you know, there's someone standing there with their hand on your shoulder. You're not alone. So. Can you tell us more about when you, positioning part of this, not all of this, but part of this as a fundraiser, where did those funds get directed afterwards? Um, all of our funding that we received the first year was, you know, that one was a loss, which it, we raised some funds after to kind of cover some of that. And it was covered. I mean, it, we were lucky. It was just about a break even. We, you know, we were in the hole, maybe $600, which we put out there and immediately like three different people said, here, you're covered. Mm -hmm. um, and we really went big and we knew we were like, we don't care. It's nice to do it and not think it has to be a fundraiser. And even with the CDs, we thought, cause every single um, survivor that asked for one got one of our CDs too. So they got gifted to them. Um, we thought we wouldn't make money, but boy, we sold the heck out of those, especially, you know, people downloading them. That's where the money mm -hmm. came in. But um, all funding that we got from that went into uh, expenses when we do our pop-up events. Um, you know, it, you the guys, local love project. Yeah, we do yeah. a lot of, we did a lot and we still, we're even looking at doing some more with some building information and things yeah. like that with the county. But um, mm -hmm. when we do them, there's always expense. So it went into that. Uh, and then also we were able to put together gift cards, enough gift cards to be able at Christmas time to uh, hand out like $200 gift cards to several hundred people, so. Oh, that's amazing. And we all know, we fire survivors know how handy and helpful the gift cards are when you just- $100, $200, it, $50, it, it all adds up and makes a big difference. And we learned that really quickly and we were able to do that. Plus we had gotten a grant that we were distributing at the time. So they not only got that, they got double 
a double whammy of goodness um, during the holidays, which was great. Oh, that's amazing. And one last question about how you integrated with the, the local electeds or officials. I mean, it sounds like your organization and other organizations did all this planning. Was, were the local, was local government involved in the planning of this event? No, no, no. And they never have been with us. Um, luckily for us, they know us, the entities, when we go into their event coordination offices or we went into permitting health department, um, alcohol, all of them already know us from our events that we already do through Totally Local VC, my other nonprofit. And then I also um, have a side production company um, and I get hired by other event companies sometimes to go in and help put on events because we've got such a strong relationship with, you know, alcohol and, um, and also with our uh, health departments and our city, mm -hmm. city departments. So we went in and I just went to the top immediately, talked to the mayors, talked to the city council, uh, was able to speak to city council in Ojai. They had me come and speak to the whole council, mm -hmm. uh, Ventura, all of them, and, and just pleaded our case. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and you didn't have to plead hard, especially your first year. Now, going into other years, it's a little different. Um, you know, they people forget, you know, quickly. And so you go in and kind of have to pitch the story, and you do. And they were very good. And the reason we picked Ojai, because they were the only ones willing to waive fees and charge they they were just please bring it to Ojai please bring it to Ojai and I think in your area if you can find a venue that is not city or county you may have better luck you won't have such massive insurance requirements I mean you're going to want to pull insurance anyways but you won't have massive insurance requirements city of Ventura is ridiculously high um, and look at things like that just look at them all and look at the venues and see who might be sympathetic to the cause if you have a fairground or you have a, a beautiful park, which we did, luckily we have the bowl, but um, that's my suggestion. And, and, but also being conscious that we really needed to include our officials because they play an important role in recovery and continuing the story to try to help fight for more funding for our counties in the recovery process, whether it even is just going into their office, into their inner workings, it's key. It's key for disaster relief, disaster preparedness. It's key for everything. It's something that I've learned, that's my takeaway, is like always engage as best as you can, even as frustrating as it can become. Well, Kat, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I, I am so sorry about the loss of your ranch and your home and, and so much of your community and their loss as well with the Thomas fire. Um, it's a long road. You're still there. You're not rebuilt yet. Um, but the, t the community is lucky to have someone with your vision and your ingenuity to help put this together. Um, I will say we're only 30% rebuilt, just so you guys know that. Um, it's a sad number to have to tell other cities that are coming in behind this in this disaster. And also to say, all of you feel free. Um, if you're doing an event and you want some advice, I'm here. I, I this is what I do. And if you want some advice or any suggestions, feel free. Uh, Pam can share my info, and I'm more than willing to help any way I can. Also, I hope all the LTRGs are connected with Ventura County's uh, LTRG and Ann Watley. They have done. I I tour. I have toured a lot of the fire areas. Reading. I was in just in Oregon. Uh, not several weeks back and, and kind of turd areas and looking at we're all, what we're all going through and coming home and just being the cheerleader to our LTRG and saying like, we're doing amazing work and I know all of you are too. And it's important to be able to encourage each other, help each other. So we're, we're here and I know Anne, I can speak for Anne in that too, that LTRG Ventura County, anything that we can do to help our brothers and sisters with what they're doing up there. Oh, thank you so much. And definitely check out the Local Love Project online um, to see, hear more about their wonderful community work. And make sure and put in the Local Love Project. Somebody started some bracelet company called the Love Project, and that's not us. <laughs> and we're not getting funds for that. But boy, they okay. sold a lot of bracelets. So, all right. right. All right, thanks. We'll, we'll definitely share the link to that. Um, so I'm gonna transition now to uh, Melissa in Paradise. And Melissa, we would love to hear about, you know, I know your story is so completely different um, mm -hmm. and it's so relevant to hear how different communities are doing the right thing at the right time. Um, 
trying. Just yours. Yeah, you know, you do what you can so, at the time. Um, it, Paradise is different, I think, because of the uh, immensity of, of the disaster in our area. We were a city of 27,500 people. 90% of the city burned. Um, all of our council members, we have a five, five member council that I was, I was sitting on. All five of us lost our homes. Um, the entire uh, community of Paradise plus uh, Megalia and parts of the county surrounding us were displaced. Um, and we could not go back into the area for, I can't even remember now, and, and please, I apologize, I get dates and times and numbers and everything wrong often, but I think it's the gray hair. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think it was, it was like three weeks over uh, Thanksgiving uh, was the holiday that fell in between. So we were all displaced during the Thanksgiving holiday and we were so grateful to the community of Chico and other surrounding communities. Um, uh, Guy Fieri was here serving Thanksgiving dinner and um, Sierra Nevada uh, Brewery also served a Thanksgiving dinner for us. And, and um, there was just so much outpouring of love from all over the state and beyond the state and around the world during those, those first few weeks. Um, one of the things that I remember saying, of course, um, <sighs> We as council members, we were inundated in those first few days before the fire had even been, before we even knew what had happened to our own homes or, or whatnot. Um, we were inundated with calls from journalists around the world. And one of the things that I said to them at that time was, the fire is a thing that happened, but our story is in our recovery and our resilience. So please come back and check with us in a year, in five years, in 10 years, and see what we've done. You know, I hear Kat mentioned the 30% rebuild, and I think we're somewhere at about 8% right now, but then we lost 90% of our, of our homes. So, you know, that was 12,000, roughly 12,000 homes that were lost. Um, I'm still in an RV. Um, but, but I'm kind of someone that, that says, hey, what else, is, what else can we do? This thing happened, now what can we do? And so um, I live on a, a uh, we have a roughly 20 acre property that uh, um, was an event facility. And so we're building that back, but we carved off three and a half acres for our best friends to build their house on. We ended up buying our son and daughter's daughter-in-law's adjacent property so that they could move into the house of their dreams. Another son, uh, we, let's see, uh, three of our, two of our sons lost their homes um, during this fire as well as my mother. And, you know, I mean, yeah, everybody, everybody did during this time. So, um, so when we began talking about the one year anniversary, um, we had been inundated over the, the year prior with press and with people from the outside. And, um, you know, there's always those that try to capitalize on, on our loss. I hate to have to say that, but it's, it's a thing. Um, so for, so what we did was to reach out to all of the organizations, whether it's a church or, um, whoever was planning to do an event and invite them to come together and sit at, sit at a table and talk about what they were doing. And it wasn't about um, competing events because we weren't competing. What we were doing was allowing, was, was creating a number of different opportunities for our community that was still mostly displaced to come back, feel safe, to um, many of them were coming back for the first time back into the town. And we knew it would be, there would be a lot of emotions. And with that, sometimes comes a lot of ugliness. Uh, we were very lucky to work with California Hope um, who offered their 
assistance at all of the events. Um, any event coordinator only had to ask and California Hope would be there because they were trained to be able to see if there was someone that needed assistance. And that was, that was invaluable. It was, it was um, so for us, it was more about taking this day and welcoming our community back recognizing that the community was the thing that was most important and um, beginning the healing process, however that looks. And also recognizing that, that, that triggers are different for different people. So it, all of that, and you know, as a, as a community leader, as a council member, I can tell you that every conversation, every meeting that we had post campfire included conversations about mental health. And I think that is so, so important to recognize. And I applaud all of you for, for, um, for knowing that you need to be sensitive and to recognize how important it is to, to understand and to, to know that this is such a difficult time, just down to the words that we use. And of course we struggled with that too. Remembrance and Memorial felt too, um, too morose and yet anniversary is too celebratory. So how do you find that balance? And, and yet there were things that we did want to celebrate. You know, We were told that it would be three years before we could move back or three years before the debris removal was complete. And we had completed debris removal in 10 months. It was, it was astounding. And that, you know, those, those, those small things are big things and they're big things to celebrate, to get us on the road to recovery and resilience. Um, so on that day, we had the, um, the town, um, the town manager worked to create one program uh, at the CMA church, uh, which was, um, uh, there was only a couple of buildings that were, that were left for us to use. Um, we also dedicated our building resiliency center, which was, uh, is still in use and is that sort of one-stop shop. We had immediately afterwards, uh, there was, the resiliency center that was open that 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 um, uh, was designed to meet the the immediate needs of people, but this is this the building resiliency center is designed to help people through the rebuilding process find the resources that they need to to rebuild or whatever it is that they need to move on. So we dedicated the building resiliency center. Um, amazing artist Jess Mercer had collected keys because all of us had keys to our homes, to our vehicles and no locks to fit those keys in. So she had collected keys and she made a beautiful Phoenix out of the keys, which resides in the building resiliency center. So if you get a chance to come to paradise, um, especially those of you, I, I know that when you've lost your home, I, I know how significant and how memorable seeing that is. That's I mean, awesome. because that's, it's one of those small things that we don't think about until, until we think about it, you know, until Definitely. we reach into our purse and, and discover that's that we key. have keys with no locks. Yeah. So, um, so that was pretty special. We set up, you know, we knew again that, that press, would be coming in. So um, we worked with an organization to manage that um, and, and to, to try to keep press away from the community. The, and I just say the community, we were all, you know, who knows who lost their homes, but it doesn't matter because we couldn't live in them. You know, <laughs> so. Yeah whether or not we lost our home, we couldn't live in them right away. So, you know, we were, we were all pretty much homeless, but, um, and, you know, the word survivor, even of course, victim, I don't even use that. The word survivor is, is a challenge for me too. I, I don't feel like I survived the campfire. I did, of course. I mean, I don't feel like I survived the campfire so much as that it, it was a chapter in our lives. 
it was a very challenging chapter in our lives. Um, so, but I, I think the important thing that we did was to invite all of the organizations who wanted to plan something. Again, it was, it was, it, there's always that group of people that, that do the planning that create the events. But in our case, these are also the same people that were traumatized. I mean, you know, our, our police officers were, were doing their jobs even as their homes were burning and they didn't know where their families were. Um, firefighters, our, our uh, town staff, you know, all of these people that are typically the ones who make things happen and organize, we were all dealing with our own tremendous sense of loss. And and um, and recovery. I, I mean, so funny story. I remember I was just thinking uh, back with a group of people um, just yesterday. Um, we were. I was looking at my friends. Of course, I've got this council hat on that I'm wearing, and I'm trying to to deal with something that does. There's no rule book. None of us had ever were prepared for for that piece, and yet we're trying to manage through that. And my friends have already, you know, talked to their insurance agents and found um, rental housing or places to live, and and we're living at at our daughter's house. And all I could do was every time I'd open my purse, my cat peed in my purse. And all I could think of was, so the cat peed in my purse. You know, it was, I didn't even know how to deal with that. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, the idea of planning this, a massive event, a one size fits all event, just, it, it, we couldn't do that. So we created this, this group and they created smaller events and people could find their tribe their their place where they felt safe and and could could process what they needed to process on that in that first year um we did have a, a wonderful group of musicians and um talented people that put on a fabulous event uh at our performing arts center with poetry and um, dramatic readings and music and it was just um, again, it wasn't anything that anyone paid money for. It was just open to whoever wanted to come. And that was done on the Sunday after the event. So the first anniversary of the campfire fell on a Saturday. The community of Megalia just above us actually burned the following day on the 9th. So they had celebrations on that day. And then on the Sunday, we had this, this um, event at the Performing Arts Center that brought everybody sort of together and it was filmed. So when we moved into the second anniversary during the pandemic, um, there uh, is a uh, um, kind of a pop-up drive-in theater in Chico that showed that film and so people were invited to attend again you know first come first served um, for free um, and the other thing that we did is um, one of the things that gave so many of us hope after the fire uh, and the as spring was starting to happen was daffodils coming up through the debris fields and the ashes and so we were able to hand out, we had a drive-through handout of daffodils. The daffodil was named as the, the official town flower. And uh, we were able to hand out daffodil bulbs. And I think there was something about people being able to plant these and then see them coming up you know, the next spring that just gave so much hope. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that we have going on other than that, but I think for that anniversary event, um, the thing that ties us, some of the things that ties us all together is, is what is the language that we use? And what is it that, that we want to, what is our goal? Um, for us in paradise, again, I think it was, it was allowing people to come back into the town that hadn't been here before, allowing people to see each other in a safe environment where they could experience their grief, they could process their losses and, um, and be protected and held up. That's amazing. 
Melissa, thank you so much. And of course, it goes without saying, I'm so sorry for your loss and the loss of oh, thousands, thousands in your community. Um, and as a civic leader, I can only imagine the weight on your shoulders that you were feeling um, having to recover for your own sake and then having to lead your town. So um, I'm so thankful that you're able to share with us the notion that you need to do what you have the capacity to do. Absolutely. And to find those who have the who are ready to organize something and point people into the right direction so they can join with those. Yeah. Yeah. I we had some of those daffodils too, and it's something magical. Yeah. You know, re regardless of anything, a, a flower bulb coming up in the spring is magical, but to certainly usher. But when it comes up through through the remnants of your oh, home and right. ashes, it's just, yeah, it's it's very, very special. We had wild fly, flowers so that we had never seen before. We get a lot of lupin and different up here, especially at our ranch, but I had the biggest bloom I'd ever seen, not just on the hillsides that had been pure, you know, it looks like moonscape, as you well know. Yeah. And then where the house was, all these flowers just coming up and it just, I totally agree. It was like a sign of hope. And and I, I just, sorry, wanted to add, Oh yeah. I lived for um, almost two years in our RV and we're finally in a modular. So I understand the RV life. So Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not complaining. It's, 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 an, oh. it's a nice RV, but. <laughs> There's just two with two big dogs and it was just like, this is what it's gonna be, you know? And, and um, it, you know, and it, it wasn't bad. People were continually, but God bless you. I just wanted to say that. Well, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to share from my perspective, you know, um, I'm in Coffee Park. Actually, I'm setting a little timer so I don't talk too much. <laughs> um, I'm from Coffee Park in Santa Rosa, California. And of course, in 2017, we um, had massive fires here just overnight. I went to bed, tucked my kids into bed, said good night. It was like 11 p.m. Gosh, it smells like smoke. And then um, with just three hours later, there was fire bearing down on our neighborhood. And in just my neighborhood alone, 1,400 houses gone within a matter of hours. Um, never did I ever dream something like that would ever happen in our tracked neighborhood. But yet here we are, and that's, that's what happened. Um, and my message of hope is I'm sitting in my rebuilt house right now doing this. And so... Look, I have pictures on the wall and I've got a roof over my head and I'm ever so grateful for that. Um, but yeah, it's a long road to recovery for sure. Um, I got involved in our neighborhood organization that came up right after the fire called, we called ourselves Coffee Strong because our neighborhood was Coffee Park. Um, and we really were beginning, some of my neighbors and I were like hearing people make kind of snap decisions about Oh, I'm going to rebuild and I'm going to use this builder and blah, blah, blah. It's like, we don't have any information yet. I don't know how you can come to that conclusion quite yet. Let's find out the lay of the land so we can make really informed decisions for our family. And so that was the beginning of our neighborhood organizing. And then, as you know, your neighbor, your whole neighborhood burns down, your whole town burns down. You can't find anybody. You know, they're all gone. So of course that was um, a big challenge from the beginning because I didn't know every one of my neighbors. So we had to find people. And I always thought from the beginning that it was gonna be really meaningful to have reasons for people to come back here. Some people even were temporarily out of state or you know, hours away living with a relative, but to have reasons to come back to the neighborhood um, on a regular basis to realize that we all belong here together. And so we did make moments like that to come and back and be in the neighborhood. Um, and of course the one year mark was an important one um, for that. And so I was, at the time, I was the lead organizer for what I considered, and I can tell you, my heart will, he feels it right now, what felt like a sacred duty to organize something that was just for our neighborhood. And like I said, it's 1,400 houses, so it was a, a quite a lot of people. Um, but we planned a one-year remembrance gathering 
And what I'd like to do, I, I prepared a couple slides with a few pictures, so I'll share them because it might just help illustrate. I'm gonna just share my screen here a second. Um, and we'll go, let's see if I can get this going. There we go. The um, Zoom controls are over top of my menu to start the slideshow. So there we go. Okay, good. Um, so we are, our homes burned in the night that night. And so we really wanted to um, hold a nighttime gathering. And there was one intersection, you know, we had a neighborhood park, which was devastated and burned. All the houses around burned. There was some on the just the peri periphery, the edges of the neighborhood, which were still standing. Um, and we love those folks who continue to live in their house and watch our recovery over years take place. And we know that couldn't have been easy. But we, what we did is we, we aimed to gather folks at this main intersection, which really mm -hmm. formed a hub. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we called it the entrance to Coffee Park. It really was a cent central intersection. Um, and it was spontaneously the very first Christmas, we were, of course, we burned in October and two months later, some people just started hanging battery powered lights on this intersection. And then it kind of grew and every kind of broke, you know, burned out tree or whatever down the road, it just kept adding, people were adding and adding more lights. But this intersection was really the hub of all that. And so that's where we gathered. And I um, arranged for, um, a permit to have what's similar to a block party permit with the city to gather in that spot. Um, and as you can see in this picture um, that was taken, this is actually from the local newspaper, a picture that they published shows some houses in construction behind them. Of course, most of the lots didn't have that, but this there were some underway right there. And to give you a picture of what our family's house looked like right uh, right after the fire. This is my family, I have three kids, my husband and me standing on our burned out lot in Coffee Park um, just after the fire. And there was a lovely artist photographer who got connected with me through a mutual friend who said, I wanna come and photograph some families um, on their lot and then come back one year later and take another picture one year later. And so, and I apologize, I'm not in, the, I don't have the, the one year later picture easy to access today. So I don't have that one here, but this is the one to, just to show you what our lot looked like after the fire. And those of you who have been in fires know this very, very intimately, but um, our whole neighborhood looked like this. And so we really needed to help each other get through and, and get back. Um, but what would be appropriate? what would be the right thing to do? And so we gathered neighbors, anybody who was interested to a planning session. And this is not the exact meeting that I had, but it looked just like this, where we just sat in the road in camp chairs and sat around on a Saturday morning and said, well, what, what should this look like? What would make sense? What should we do? And uh, people had all kinds of ideas. They had way, it was probably about, 15 to 20 people came and we brain, brainstormed and I started a Google document and we just figured out the list of things that we might wanna do. People said music, people said poetry, people said um, remembrance for those people who died in our neighborhood. There were five people who passed away the night of the fire in my neighborhood. And incidentally at that same corner that was so significant for us, um, Coffee Strong got a grant and worked hard to put in a little bit of landscaping there because it is it is public area a public area and not um, privately owned. It's five uh, flowering cherry trees that were remembrance trees for each of those people who passed away that night. And so and over the more recent time, we've we've really filled out that landscaping more in collaboration with the city. And so there is a memorial to those folks, to their lives there. 
Well, gosh, one thing that we realized that if we are going to dedicate these trees and and mention these people who perished that night, we need to contact their next of kin and we need to to reach out. So that was a, a job to reach out to those family members and and let them know that this is what we wanted to do and to invite them to actually pick which tree was the one that rec that was planted in memory of their loved one. And so some people volunteered to do some of that legwork to reach out to extended family of those five people. Um, and then others in the neighborhood um, had, to, like, like you said, Kat, some people had connections to folks who were musicians and luckily somebody knew, there was like a, um, not our symphony, but like a local uh, orchestra that was more of a volunteer type of orchestra connection to a group like that who could come and play. So we had a string quartet play at our event. Um, again, California Hope came to the event and provided on-site emotional support services. There was a tent set up for them. So if someone felt like they really needed to speak to somebody, it was on-site ready and available with several of their counselors on-site at the event. Um, let's see what else. Um, and so on the very same Google document, we created um, a sheet of things that needed to get done, who would do them, had comments, and we collaborated that way. This is just to give some practical tips for how you might approach getting ready for this. We had a budget of zero, basically, and we got everything donated and did everything as volunteers. So um, we, didn't, we didn't start with a budget or try to have a budget. One of our um, neighbors is a pastor of a local Baptist church and the church was willing to donate some things. We wanted to have Luminaria at the event and they donated that. So they purchased the little um, flameless candles, bags, sand, and people wrote on Luminaria in memory of or hopeful messages for that. Um, And then here's a project that I, I did. I, I contacted a local makerspace um, where people do kind of digital uh, building and art stuff and just took a big piece of plywood actually. Um, I came up with this little design that says come home soon. Um, and we had that cut for us at the makerspace. They use a laser um, cutter, CNC cutter uh to cut out this shape and it became a place where we had ribbons that people wrote uh, messages of hope or prayers whatever they felt like they wanted to write on this um, structure that was at the corner there um, and it became covered in ribbons uh, with messages from all the people who attended a local artist made a beautiful watercolor painting of this that was meaningful um, and I have a link to a video that will show you how it looked once it was covered, but it just said come home soon. And then that sat at that corner, I think for the next several months until it just got kind of too dilapidated and we took it down, but it was just a remembrance that we hope everybody comes home soon. And the one year remembrance gathering was, was um, promoted on Facebook. And it was in the invitation said, organized by Coffee Strong, by neighbors, for neighbors. And one point that's really interesting is this light up sign that says, miss you guys, came from Lake County that had a couple of years prior to us had devastating fires and they paid it forward to us and had, had that sign, um, let us have that sign. And we kept that up in the neighborhood for quite a while before we passed it on forward. And um, I made this, this uh, remember sign just using my uh, at home supplies with the names of the folks who, who perished that night. And that was set up next to the trees. And that stayed out for a really a couple of years until we took that sign down and replaced it. And then um, we orchestrated a program and I was kind of the lead person on 
on stage, which is really a box that I just stood up on top of that was loaned to me by my daughter's dance studio because they had a lot of props. Um, the church brought in their um, microphones and, and sound equipment, which if I can give any advice, I'd say I didn't have enough speakers. We should have had more speakers because some people in the back had trouble hearing. We tried to minimize the presence of media at the event because we really didn't want this to be a media show. There was one um, TV station allowed and the local paper um, was allowed. But other than that, we tried to really keep it to be just us so that we could have that quiet time together. And if I could tell you that you can see some of it on the screen, we began by some contemplation. People came in quietly. Again, it was twilight when we began. Um, and then people were invited to create the luminaries and place them in a line along the curb. Um, and then we paid respects to the folks who lost their lives by naming them and ringing a bell. And we narrated um, some of the program with one of my favorite moments when I was up there, um, inviting people to grieve together but in inviting people to be just in the moment because we're so much thinking about what happened and then when will the next thing be done? When will the debris removal be done? When will the permit be, be approved? When will um, my house be done? And everybody asked me that question over and over again. And I just invited people to let that all go and just be here in the moment. And I asked everyone to take one giant collective sigh. And that was such a moment to hear everybody sigh all at once, um, really cleansing. Um, and then a couple people who had been writing poetry and sometimes sharing it on Facebook or other, other venues, um, we invited them up to read their poetry. Um, and that was meaningful. They were just neighbors, people who were writing poetry. And we had a moment of gratitude as well, um, what we were grateful for in the time that we had together. And as it, as it progressed, it was a really, it was a really wonderful um, moment for just our neighborhood to share. And I'm wondering if, if you might, if you don't mind, I'm going to share a short two minute video and I'm hopefully the sound will come through, but even if the sound doesn't come through um, on Zoom, it shows you all those things in action. So I'm going to go ahead and try to play that a second. Can you hear the sound? Oops, I hit pause by accident. As the sun went down on the first anniversary of the firestorms, Coffee Park lit up with color, signs of remembrance, and the warmth of hundreds of friends. We together as a community can suffer together and can be sad together, as well as be strong together. In this place, shared loss mixed with a shared determination to move forward forward but never forgetting the friends lost homes burned and lives scattered to the wind we're in a talk carol collins swayze valerie lynn evans marjorie marnie schwartz Tamara Latrice Thomas. Scores of luminaries carried messages of hope and a community on the rebound. This night was about finding friends and sharing memories. You don't know what PTSD is because it, uh, it affects every, everybody differently. Um, if you lose your keys, you go to pieces. 
if you think somebody something's missing or somebody took something, you go to pieces. Just seeing everyone and how they've grown and seeing all of the um, rebuilding and all the progress and everything. So that's really nice to see all the progress, yeah. I've been living here for the last 16 years of my life. So I've grew up in this neighborhood. We've been best friends since sixth grade. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's been good because like we're both upper houses are at the same structure. Yeah. From each other so for it's been really exciting. <laughs> In Coffee Park, as elsewhere in Sonoma County, there will be many more days and nights before life returns to a semblance of normalcy. But for one magical evening, this community's strength of spirit, its resiliency was on full, glorious display. In Coffee Park, Carl Van Emberg for News of the North Bay. So, um... I just wanted to say one other thing. I had reached out to the city of Santa Rosa's representative who planned a civic ceremony for the one year remembrance that involved our firefighters and our police force and other first responders. And they were very sensitive about how to go about that. And they did a very large uh, polling of those folks who were fire survivors to figure out what they should do. And they really didn't want to get on stage. They were very worried about making it sound like they had accomplished something when there was so much to be done. There was so much healing that needed to occur. And I don't have pictures of that, but it was, it was a, kind of a solemn ceremony again with ringing bells and just standing in silence. And that was in our a town square in downtown Santa Rosa. Um, so that happened as well. And so ours was just for our neighborhood, but similar to um, how Melissa mentioned that there were like different pockets had something that was meaningful to them and made sense to them. And um, anyway, you can see how the three of us were all involved, but it, it did it differently for what seemed right for our own neighborhoods. Now, Julie wanted to share something about how, um, even though they haven't reached their one year mark, there was a, a meaningful gathering at Christmas time. We'd love to hear what you have to say, Julie. Thanks so much. I just also want to say a shout out to Tiffany Lambert, who's with Phoenix Talent Rising, an amazing community organization who's definitely involved in uh, trying to figure out how to mark this one year anniversary. But one of the things I just wanted to share with people, and Kathy, you mentioned it, um, in our Christmas celebration, we actually had an organization called Remake Talent that put together a, a, an event called the Snow Globe. And it was an opportunity to, in an outdoor setting, because we were in a pandemic, um, for people to gather, but to be covered, to have some uh, heaters there and to be gifted. Um, and we made sure that one of the things we really wanted to make sure is that people were actually gift gifted gift cards and cash because they needed to know what they needed. They needed to be able to get what they needed, not necessarily just to be given something that they weren't sure what to do with. And we really recognized that early on in the recovery, what an individual needs is not something that someone else can tell them. They really need to be able to have that themselves. So they need to have the cash to pay for their cell phone. They need to have cash to get gas. They need to pay for dog food. You know, it's like whatever they personally need, um, they needed to be able to have that. And so we worked really hard to make sure that it didn't become, unfortunately, sometimes a dumping ground for people who just want to get rid of things, but really um, as much flexibility as possible. So I want to make sure I share that with communities that when you're doing those beginning days of recovery, giving the flexibility of those um, fire survivors to, to do what they need to do is actually is really, really important. And I just wanna thank all of you guys for sharing. Um, you know, we are coming up on our anniversary. So we will see how that goes. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for mentioning that Tiffany Lambert has joined in. Tiffany, um, I was midstream when you jumped in, and so I neglected that, but please introduce yourself a moment. I apologize that I was late. I, I'm no worry. with um, the Phoenix Talent School District, and um, so um, of the 5,000 residents that lost their home, it incorporated our district boundaries, school district boundaries of Phoenix Talent and the unincorporated parts of Medford, um, Oregon. So we've kind of our impromptu um, Phoenix Talent Rising is um, kind of just our motto of, of how we as a school district and a, a member of the community can help with the recovery. So we did have our, um, our Phoenix Talent Rising um, fire relief. We collected over $2 million in donations that we delivered directly to 
fire survivors. So most of our families who lost their homes in the fire got between two and $3,000 cash. Um, and we also collected tens of thousands of dollars in um, gift cards, as well as getting grants to make sure that all of our families who lost their homes in the fire had a good holiday, which included uh, a Christmas time holiday, meals and gifts for all their family members and such, as well as our RV donation program with Rogue Retreat, which is a local organization. We collected um, donated trailers and um, RVs, RV type trailers, and have them in the parks with spaces paid for by the Department of Human Services for the State of Oregon Emergency Management. So uh, when, you, when you ask like how the school district get involved, whew, we've learned a lot about FEMA and, uh, and insurance and such. So I do appreciate um, the information you're given and hoping to see how our summer projects um, can help with the one year commemoration. So we have summer school going on right now. Looks like I'm wearing a weird tee, but I'm wearing our summer school t-shirts um, and our summer programs with an emphasis on that social emotional learning. So we do have 700 students that lost their homes mm -hmm. in the fire. So we've handpicked a selection of some and we're creating with Talent Maker City, um, one of our, our makerspace local organization, um, some Manzanita branches, sculptures, um, so each student who's a fire survivor will create these like pieces of the branch will, which will then become these sculptures, metal sculptures, with the thought that the manzanita tree, which is a local tree, does uh, very strong in the fire and rebuilding that. So um, we also have classes that are creating uh, interpretive signs for the greenway, which is the path in which the fire kind of uh, followed very quickly. Um, and we've got a special use permit to install those. So. That's what we're doing with our mental health professionals and our teachers in Talent Maker City. And so we're hoping we could somehow get those into the one year commemoration that the community um, might yeah. put on. So awesome. that's where we're at. We, we, all, we do appreciate, uh, right after the fire, we'll say, um, um, I grew up in Santa Rosa um, in uh, that area. So we were able to um, talk with people from Santa Rosa and Paradise who really helped us um, how we could respond as a school district. So we appreciate that help. And I know it's a terrible time, but we're hoping that um, even though this experience um, was is very hard, that we, when we're, when we'll look back and be as strong as um, you all are and be able to help others. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like wildfires are going to be stopping anytime soon in the West. So. Um, Thanks for all your help and for, for sharing your stories with us. Yeah, no problem. And thank you. You know, working through and with the school district is such an important way of really supporting families and children and reaching folks who might not find us otherwise and find that help otherwise. And so the, the services that you're able to provide and the, the heartfelt support from every teacher to those students I have a background in education, so I am kind of biased, but uh, <laughs> at the time of the fire, I was a public school teacher um, and I'm not anymore, but that role is so essential. And, and if we can help families um, and we wanna keep families in our towns, right? We want them there, that, that's what makes our, our town have a future, frankly. You know, I, I totally agree with that, Pamela. Yeah. On the other hand, I also think it's important to allow people to make other decisions, you know, over and over during the, the first few years. And, and it's just the narrative is just starting to change a little bit now, two and a half years later. But it was, we need to get people back. Oh, yeah. And it didn't leave space for those who couldn't come back for a variety of reasons. And yes. I think that, you know, while we're giving ourselves grace to, to heal and move through this, we need to give people grace to make other decisions that are equally as difficult to move out of the community and be confident that others are going to come in because it's right for them. And, you know, with that, I, I think overall, as we're moving into this, this phase of, of global warming and, and these, these disastrous fires that continue to happen here in the West, um, there's an educational piece too. 
Um, yes, we need to absolutely need to be aware of, of mental health issues and the trauma that we all experienced and to be able to, to help people move through that. But how do we, how do we resurrect ourselves in a way that is resilient and hardened and, and, you know, how do we, how do we make those decisions and, and how do we help our communities make those decisions as well? And I, I think, you know, yeah. And yeah. Tiffany, yeah. Tiffany, huge shout out to you. Um, teachers, uh, we worked close with our junior high school. A lot of people rallied and started helping the students that were high school level in our community, but forgot, you know, just forgot about those junior high. We have been talking to the high school about doing something for their students specifically, and then it, they just were, the, you know, I work with a lot of the high school teachers anyways on ag education, but they said, Kat, there's so much. And I had my grandson's junior high asked uh, his teacher about students. She was able to acquire the names, which schools. We did a partnership with Zappos and each student got a $500 gift card so that they were able to choose their own new wardrobe, shoes, clothing. Um, and also our, our outreaches when they came up with the pop-ups initially, which was really impactful, was Patagonia, um, Nike, Billabong, Quicksilver, all of them. We started calling our connections and we were able to, to not only do one, so adults came in and got what they needed as a family or individual, but we went into the schools and did a little bit there too for students. Um, and another suggestion too is the bicycle companies. We were able to get and work with our local bike shop and got a ton of bicycles and helmets donated. And specifically, there were some students that rode to school that was their way of getting back and forth to school or their treasured bike. And those parents had told that story in our recovery, um, you know, when they sign up with us, we were able to get them specific bikes and helmets and replace those for them. And as well as a backpack program, fill the backpack uh, based on what school level it was, uh, we packed and we're able to fill that, but we couldn't have done any of it without the teacher's guidance and directing us in need. Um, it seemed to be a gap that we hadn't planned on. You know, you expect the parent who's in shock to tell you everything that they need. And those students in their prime, prime of like development, you know, want to fit in and now they have nothing. And we learned a lot in that process about really making sure that we're looking at all the different levels of the individual that's impacted. So again i thank you teachers were a huge part of everything that we did in the in our learning curve so thanks kathy i, I wrote down some of your ideas i mean our, anything uh, asked um, me i've got a long list of <laughs> like hit this person up hit these people up but yeah it's 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 important so yeah that would be great i mean our fire happened on september 8th 2020 which was the first day of school um, oh. we were virtual learning because of the pandemic yeah Guess what day is our first day of school this year? I didn't plan it. It's September 8th, 2021. Oh. So um, I mean, like worst first day of school ever. Why did we do it again? This year's just where it fell with the Labor Day holiday. But um, I like the idea of maybe having some plans because a lot of our students, most of our students are still in motels or hotels or um, RV trailers and stuff, getting where they can pick out their own outfits and such. I mean, we got donations right after the fire. So we had like, t-shirts and clothes and stuff but starting out the school year and like the cool new shoes that right that they actually want and yeah. it was just their faces coming in we did for two weeks we did used and we realized that's the nightmare with you know the disaster within the disaster and we quickly got our way out of that one and um said no nothing but new and so we went into that mode and started working hard on that but i, I wanted to comment too pamela you talked about or i, I was sure it was melissa about the firemen um, at our events too, we always had sheriff and um, our fire chiefs came and spoke, but they came up on their idea. They all came up on stage together, police, sheriff, and fire. And we had some um, uh, of the brush guys, you know, uh, the hotspot guys come up with them. And everybody, it just, that was heartwarming. They were all in tears as well. So I think you were right in the comment. Like we have to acknowledge every step and even though how bashful they are in fear of not wanting that attention because as they say, they, my ex-husband is a firefighter. They get paid to do that. And he mm -hmm. kept saying, we get paid to do that, you know, but they risk their lives to do that. So 
Yeah, yeah, one of the things we did right after the fire, we always had that our, our local police department always did this shop with a cop at Christmas time. You know, we raise money and, and um, so working with the schools and the teachers, certain children were selected to shop with a cop and they, you know, bought, they were given a hundred dollars or whatever it was to shop at the local Kmart and buy gifts, Christmas gifts for their, their families. And um, then they were allowed to to pick out a gift for themselves. And then the cheerleaders would wrap them. And while they were seeing a, a watching a, a movie, a matinee, the cheerleaders would come in and wrap all the gifts for these kids, which it was fantastic. But of course, after the campfire, we didn't have the Kmart. We didn't have, we couldn't, we couldn't, you know, we, it, we didn't, couldn't do that. So I arranged with our local Target, a shop for a cop instead of shop with a cop, shop for a cop, because most of our police department had also lost their homes or they just didn't, or they were, I mean, they were working so many hours afterwards. They just, they, you know, it was, it was so gratifying to be able to turn that around and say, thank you for what you've gone through. And we recognize that, that you need things too. And I think through the, through uh, local agencies, we have a, you know, relatively small um, police department um, but I think we were able to give them each something like, I don't know, $350 or something like that to shop at Target. That's really so nice. It, it, it was meaningful. Yeah. I, I tell you, it's just the, the, my, my best, uh, memory of everything that we did actually is that, you know, like the, being able to put the stockings in the, in the rooms of all the people that were there, but also the firefighters. Uh, one young man came down and he found us because we were rapping, doing other stuff too. And he, he found us and um, he said, I had to come down and say, thank you. He said, you know, I, oh, I'm single. I, my parents are gone. I work every Christmas because, you know, they'll take the shift for the guy who's got a family. I, I haven't had a gift in five years. And he's standing there crying, holding his stocking. And we were all just like, Whoa, you know, <laughs> and hugging big Aww. hugs. And we said, okay every year you're going to get a card or something from us, but um, it means a lot to them, you know, and I think it's important as we go through planning remembrances, we remember all of those that have made differences, whether they be our pastors, our, our, our faith-based groups, our, our firefighters, our police officers, our city officials, those people that stepped up. I say all the time, you know, my new, my new, uh, my new power, I have a new superpower. And I said, I see heroes. And they don't wear capes and they aren't the ones you expect. They're those people that in time of disaster, they just show up. And we know those. They're just these individuals that do amazing things, like all of you have done. I mean, it's just, you know, that to me is the biggest thing that I, I look back and I say so many heroes in our community. You know, as we're talking about these these anniversary events, what, one of the things that I'm hearing going through all of this is that it's not necessarily the anniversary events that are the most meaningful. I think those those holidays that we typically gather, um, particularly Christmas, um, is those are the ones that where all of these things come up. And I think that you know, being that that maybe. Um, putting special emphasis on that is is almost more meaningful than than marking the day that the disaster happened. I don't know. I mean, I just I just feel that as I hear, and I know that for for Paradise, probably the most the most impactful, most meaningful event that unfortunately I wasn't able to attend because I was in Texas um, for the birth of my final grandchild my last grandchild um but we had our tree lighting ceremony at our park and that was that was marked the first time that everyone was able to to gather back in town and it was just it was even though i was that far away i was watching it and it was it was so so powerful and meaningful and healing yeah. so. i can tell you as far as coffee park is concerned after a couple of years of marking the uh, day of the fire, we've decided to instead mark the day that the first house was done. Yes, it's in, it was in May, and it's good. It's good for a street picnic. You know, we're going to celebrate when that first house was finished because that was a real 
real amazing day for all of us with a lot of hope. So we just said, okay, we're, we're done with that. And when we redid our park, our city park, which the city was really good at working with us, we said, we, we don't want any fire imagery here. You know, yeah. yes, any fire imagery at all. And there was a local artist, there was some public art money. Um, the kids got really involved in what that imagery should be. And it was a drop of water. And so, you know, and you could tie that to like fighting the fire, but there's so many ways you could take a drop of water. And that was what the sculpture was about. Yeah. Ours was a Phoenix too, but if you see our logo for our events, it was, it's, you have to really look at it to realize it's a very abstract Phoenix, but it was beautiful from an artist. But um, we were the same. We said, no fire. We yeah. ran, um, what we did is we ran a video at the very beginning. It was actually a, a movie um, clip that um, had been done on our, our fire. And then in the middle of the intermission, a local artist, uh, Todd Hedigan, had written a song about the wildfire. And he's very well known um, musician and he had written it and did a video along with it with clips from Ojai area. Uh, so many of his friends had lost their homes. So that was pretty impactful doing that. And, and also something too, and I don't know if this would work with the school, but one thing we did is we created this big wings and we have like little post-its and everyone could write like something they wanted to just let go of or encouraging, encur something encouraging. Um, to a wildfire survivor and it was covered at the end with all these wonderful messages and mm -hmm. might be students could do that and you could have it at the school which would be kind of cool for other students to I can't imagine kids coming back to school after this like they're coming out of COVID they're coming out of wildfire mm -hmm. and they've got to come back to school and try to feel normal I just mm -hmm. can't even fathom that for a child so I I, whew, I just one recent thing that we did too, it was almost like a time capsule, is after the fire, a local pottery painting studio invited folks to come and paint a little four by four tile. And there were all kinds of thank you firefighters, we're Sonoma strong, um, all kinds of gratitude, hope, love and remembrance kind of things on those. In, in addition to just pictures of birds and butterflies and, and happy, imagery well they sat for several years without us like knowing what to do with them and recently we created what we called a resilience pathway and made stepping stones with them interspersed those stepping stones with those words about resilience which are empathy hope um, generosity grace uh, resilience and now that lies at that same place where those cherry trees are and where the the entrance to Coffee Park is. So we're always like adding layers. But first, of, but what I wanted to say is thank you so much. We've hit our time. In fact, I'm a little bit over and I want to be respectful of that. I am inspired and always filled with hope when I have a chance to connect with these um, wonderful people from, from Paradise and with you, Kat, from the Thomas uh, and Ventura area. And thank you so much, Julie and Tiffany and Valerie for being here live. But of course, as you know, we'll share this on our YouTube channel and please let others have a chance to, to hear, um, hear these messages and get ready for an uh, important, important day. Nice to meet you all. Very nice.